But now we need to step back from AI to come up with the new behavior that our AI will be doing. We're going to want this AI to track Link, which we kind of already are. He's passing over bushes and rocks and other things that he should not be passing over. We need the AI to be able to navigate the world properly. The functionality that we're going to end up creating is essentially we're going to put our enemy on rails where he travels along these rails to find Link. He'll be unable to fall off the rails or crash, i.e. fall into collidables like bushes or rocks. And this will give off the impression that the enemy is also traveling the world in the same way that the player is traveling the world. That is why in this section of the video, I'm going to be introducing to you two algorithms and a data structure. Now, if you've been a computer science student, you went to university or attended some kind of computer science courses, you probably have heard the terms data structures and algorithms before. If you have not, that's fine. You don't need to. I'll be going through it all right now. I'll be just introducing to you to start a graph data structure, as well as two well-known algorithms, the binary search algorithm and Dijkstra's algorithm. I'm going to teach you the binary search algorithm first, and then we will approach what the concept of a graph is, followed by the application of Dijkstra's algorithm. I'm going to teach you the binary search algorithm first as the first thing we touch upon. I'll give you the whole overview after we've learned this, but it's important that we learn how to do this first and as we go, you'll understand the framework that I'm building this feature in a little bit better. And before we begin with the binary search algorithm, I will mention that the binary search algorithm is one of many algorithms within a certain class of algorithms. There are different ways to do searches and they can be applied upon different kinds of data structures. If you've ever applied to a job as a programmer, you know you probably had studied things like this before because a lot of interview questions revolve around how well you know algorithms. This one is a special algorithm in its class and it's incredibly fast. What it does is it finds a certain value within an array and returns that value. Sounds simple, right? However, there's one very important assumption that this algorithm requires in order to work properly. And what it requires is that the array is already ordered. And luckily, I know that the data we'll be working with in the future to make this pathing feature for our AI work, I know already that it will be sorted. So we can preemptively create this algorithm. What I want to do is I'm going to go in here and I'm going to create a new folder called you. Oh, you know what? Let's just keep it at the top because later on, we actually will be moving this into the data structure itself, this function. We can close out all of our other files. And I'm going to write just a little information that I already mentioned. So what is binary search? It is an algorithm that we can use to find a value in a sorted array. What is a sorted array? A sorted array. A sorted array is something that looks like this. It has values that are in order. 35, 47, uh, 59, etc. And how this algorithm is going to work is actually a very simple concept. So this algorithm essentially works by taking the value that we're searching for and comparing it to the middle value within the array. If the value we are searching, and I know I'll go down to the next spot. If the value we are searching for is smaller or larger, it will, or we will, we will take all the values of the array that are to the left of the middle value or take all the values to the right respectively. And we will repeat this process until we find the value or we determine that the array we're currently working with has no more values to go through. So I'll take this example right here. Let's see how many elements are in it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There's 10 elements. So length is 10. 
of the array. So how this will work is we're going to have a while loop that says while the left side of the array is less than the right side of the array or less than or equal to, then do something, right? So we're going to have these two values and we're going to set them. And then we're taking the middle value, which we'll get by dividing R divided by two. And R in this case will be nine, L will be one. So we'll divide this by two and just do a math floor and we can set it to zero, one, two, three, four, and we can have this as middle. We cannot have a decimal in this case. And let's say, so let's say the value we're searching for is 32, right? So target, or let's make it weirder. Let's make it target is 57, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to take the middle value with the for loop or with the while loop and say, is array M less than or less than or greater than target? So array M is 14 and that is less than the target. So that must mean that our target value is in the greater half of the array. So what we do then, so 14 is less than, so we must target, we are our target. So our target must be in the second half of the array. So we take this same array and we go, okay, let's look at this half. We leave M here for, the, for a moment and we just add one to M to, and set it to L. Or sorry, we'll do left is equal to M plus one. There you go. So then left is right here and right stays at the same point that it was always at. And then we set M equal to right minus left, capital that to make it more obvious. And then divide this by two math floor so that way there's no decimals so what is l now well l is equal to zero one two three four five right is equal to nine so that means m is equal to is equal to four but divided by two i forgot we need to also add it back to l so this will be five plus two so it'll be equal to seven so six, seven, and we keep going. So let's try that again. So 45 is less than 57, obviously. So let's do this whole thing again. So we will, oh, and I messed up the spacing a little bit. Let's fix that. Okay. Okay, so L is equal to five. R is equal to nine. Middle is equal to math floor. Right minus left divided by two plus L, same formula. But first we're going to actually do M plus one, sorry. So it's equal to eight. Let's move L to here. And let's do this math. So R minus L, so nine minus eight equals one, divided by two equals 0 0.5. Math floor is actually going to bring this to zero. So M is essentially going to be equaling to eight too. It gets a little weird at the end of these, at the end of the arrays, but it still works out just fine. So then M and L have the same value. And then the final question is, Array M equal to 57. Yes, it is. Return this value. And that's how it's going to work. This is the pseudocode to understand how this functions properly. Now, if I just want to bring this up, if 57 was actually at the end. So if it looked, you know, I'll just make a whole new comment so it's clear. So hypothetical. If 57 was actually the end of the array, 
this would still work out just fine. What would end up happening is all these values would be the same value like that. If now if the value did not exist, what then would end up happening is M and R middle and right would be at 57 and I'll write if did not exist if 57 last value L would be over here it would be out of the array and at that point the while loop would break and we'd return an undefined or whatever kind of error handling you would like to set up for this function so that's the theory I hope you enjoy this part I really like algorithms it's actually one of my favorite things because it feels like I'm solving a puzzle if you don't like it very much that's okay these things sometimes can be a little difficult to wrap your head around the first time, but don't worry, we're going to walk through this function or this algorithm right now. One thing I will say, there is going to be a very small difference between the typical binary search algorithm and the binary search algorithm that we will write. The one that you and I are going to write together is one that we'll get the value that's the closest value to the target. And you're going to see why later, but as a brief explanation, we're going to be searching for the values that the navigatable tiles have in terms of X and Y. We're looking for those X and Y values. Now, Link, he can be in between values sometimes. It's not always very clear because he's the player. The player does not move along a railroad track similar to how the AI is going to. However, to handle an entity that does not navigate the world in that manner, there needs to be some approximations done. So to begin, our binary search function, we can just define it like this. It's going to take an array of integers and a target value that it's looking for. So just like in this example, we are going to have a left value and the left value is going to be equal to zero the right value is going to be equal to the length of the array minus one to get the final indice of the array and then the middle can simply be set as right divided by two and we'll floor it so we don't get a decimal cool So I'm going to take this example again, and we can go through it. There we go. So let's create a while loop. So while left is less than or equal to right. And we need it equal to as well in the edge case that it goes to the very end. So the first thing that I'm going to do, and this is something I just mentioned about how we're going to be taking the closest value. I want to keep a variable that tracks which value is the closest value. So I actually do need one more vari variable up here and it's going to be the closest val value. And to begin, we can set it to infinity. So now we want to compare the difference between the target value and the middle value and the difference between the target value and the closest value. So if the array middle minus the target value and we're going to do math absolute because we just want the absolute difference is less than math absolute closest value and minus target set the closest value to array middle so that's the first part of our logic and now we can handle the logic we can do the thinking that we were doing before so let's do if the array middle value is less than our target value, just like up here, 
then that means we must move left to the right plus one. So to the right of middle plus one. So we can do middle plus one. And don't worry, we will be handling the reassignment of the middle value in a second. Then I want to handle the other situation that could possibly occur where the value is actually greater than the target. And if that's the case, we need to move to the left. We didn't go through this, but I assume you could probably tell that instead of left being moved to 22 like that, what we need to do is actually move the right to the left of middle by one like that. So we'll just set right equal to middle minus one. The next possibility is that the array middle value can just equal the target. And if so, we'll just return the array middle. However, if there's never the proper value found, we should return our closest value after the for while loop is completed. And that looks almost good. Uh, I want to actually just make, although I was tempted to use M, let's just write out the complete name of the variable right here. Keep it consistent. Cool. And then we'll finally set the middle value to what we had defined it to be before. Could pretty much just copy and paste that. We'll add the right, left, plus left values again. And now let's test it out. Now I know that before we started, I never made you install node. Perhaps you have not installed it. If you have node installed, you can actually just test this right in your terminal. But for those who may not have installed node, I'm going to test it in our browser instead. Copy the function that you wrote, go into your browser, then click inspect after you right click the screen. Click on a console, and this can be your own little playground where you test out JavaScript code. Paste your function in here and press enter. You should get returned back undefined. That means your function exists within the console's scope. What I want you to do now is copy and paste this array into the console. Follow me, you can set it like this const. We can set it as a const array equal to, and then just paste it like that. And you should see if you type ARR that you have the array right there. Cool. So what I want to do now is I want to call binary search, or I want to do, I want to set a variable to binary search. I'll set, I'll call it Z. I'm going to pass the array and I'm going to select a value that I'm looking for. Now let's just select an easy value. Let's select something like five. Let's see if it finds it. Oh, it says math floor is not a function. Uh, that is because I have these two little marks in here. Do you see that? That was just a typo. So to fix that, copy this, repaste it in, and then navigate in the function definition to where those values are, delete it, and then redeclare it. Let's call it again. Cool. And now let's do console.logout z. And it looks like it found five within the array. If you're still not convinced though, let's try other values. So why don't we set const z and we'll set it to, let's do 35, 35. And you can see in this array that it does not exist. However, the closest value to 35 is 32. It should return back 32. So let's press enter and let's console.log out Z. And we got 32, just like we should. Now let's do a value that's outside. Let's go for negative 10. And if you see again, we have zero, so it should just return zero. Set it again to Z, press enter, console.log out Z. 
and we got zero. So that is the binary search algorithm. Congratulations. It's a very important thing to know how to do. Algorithms is especially important when you go on programming interviews or code interviews for a company. And this is all the code that it took. It wasn't very long, but it is pretty powerful. So the second thing we need to build now to create this enemy on rails feature is a graph data structure. And our graph data structure is going to map the world of navigatable tiles that are accessible to this enemy. And we're going to do things a little bit different for this feature. I've created a PowerPoint slide presentation to go through it with you guys because not only do we need to learn about graphs, which if you have no prior experience of, that might be a little difficult to grasp at first, but we also need to learn about a very complicated algorithm known as Dijkstra's algorithm that we'll be using to navigate through this graph to find where link is from the viewpoint of the enemy. So let's begin with just a what is a graph, right? I've been saying this word now a few times. I still haven't really explained what it is very well. A graph is a data structure that has a set of nodes. We can call them vertices that have connections between one another. And these connections are called edges. Put it in presenter form so you guys can see it easier. Okay, so where are graphs used? Graphs are actually used in many places and you may be using a graph every single day and not even know it. So they're used in things like social networks, network routing, machine learning, recommendation fun functionality on things such as Netflix or airline websites, and GPS functionality. So I can give you an example. Uh, for network routing, graphs are used to map the shortest path that data should take from one point to the other. In social networks, graphs are typically used to model the relationship between individuals and each other or individuals in certain groups. So it's very useful in making analyses and predictions about future events as it relates to people and their interests. On that same token, that's also why it's useful for machine learning because of the analyses that graphs are able to provide us with. It's also used in recommendation functionalities where if a certain movie or TV show perhaps is tagged with certain kinds of tags, certain kinds of qualities, like perhaps it's a romance or a drama or you like watching anime a lot, graphs are used to determine what other movies and films are similar to the one that you like or the ones that you like therefore providing the application an ability to recommend others to you. And last but not least, the one that is actually most relevant to us in this video is GPS functionality. Now graphs undergird all of the GPS functionalities that you might use. You may use Apple Maps or Google Maps or something in between one of the other applications. And at its core, it's a graph. Let me show you what I mean. These are some categories of graphs. We have weighted and unweighted graphs where it costs a certain amount to travel between points. I have these on the very bottom if you see right here. Between B1 and C5 we have 60. A3 to C5 is 20. Where we have an unweighted graph where there is no cost associated with traveling in between points. We have directed versus undirected graphs where from point A you can go to point B, but perhaps it's not possible to go from point B to point A. There are many types of graphs, but for our purposes, it's just important to know what an unweighted and weighted graph are. And now I'll show you a more practical example of a graph, what these relationships look like in code. So to our left, we have the example of the unweighted graph. So I wrote this out in JavaScript pseudocode. It looks like an object, right? It's an object and the key is the node itself. The value is an array of edges or connections to that node. So let's start at B. For example, B right here, it only has one connection as we can see. It connects to C. Now that we understand that, let's go to C. And let's look at all the connections that C has. 
C is connected to B. We can see that line. C is connected to A. And C is also connected to D. Let's go to A. We can see that A is connected to C. And then A is also connected to D. And so on and so forth. If we go to the weighted graph, it's slightly different. And we'll take a look at this. Now, the same graph but weighted. We can see that B, if we, if we look at B, it's still connected to C. But now it has this 60 value attached to the edge. So here we have B in the object. And we also have an array, but now instead of an array of strings, it's like an array of objects. So within this object is the, another key of C with that connection or with that weighted value of 60. Let's go to C now. And we can see that within the array, there are multiple objects, each object representing a edge or a connection between the nodes. So B has that value 60. If we see on the chart C to A, there's a value of 20. We can see in this object that the key is the other node it's connecting to, and the value within this object is 20, and so on and so forth. Graphs are able to be represented in a few different ways. This method of representing a graph is called an adjacency list. We will be using this kind of methodology, this adjacency list, to represent our graph in code. Now that we understand a little bit about what a graph looks like and how we can represent it in code, I would like to introduce you to Dijkstra and his world famous algorithm. So Dijkstra, who was he and what was his algorithm? As I've written here, he was a world renowned Dutch physicist slash computer scientist. He made a number of important contributions to both fields, one of which is the aforementioned algorithm that bears his name. Now, I wouldn't be exaggerating at all to tell you that he literally revolutionized several fields within computer science. I do suggest you Google the man. He was a very important computer scientist and helped change our lives for the better in a lot of ways. His algorithm is easy to explain, but not as easy to implement. Very simply, it's an algorithm that just finds the shortest path between two points on a graph. And why is this useful? Well, I did mention before a few of the things that graphs can do for us. And I did mention how its GPS functionality is the most important thing for us today in this video. Google Maps and Apple Maps, I mentioned, do use a graph. But what I didn't mention is that they also use Dijkstra's algorithm on this graph. Now, the applications are a bit more complex since they take into account a lot more things than we need to take into account, such as traffic, accidents, inclement weather, etc. But at the core of these applications is the graph and Dijkstra's algorithm. We will be programming out Dijkstra's algorithm and a graph of all the navigatable tiles that our enemy AI can travel on. But before we get to that, let's look at a practical example so it can build your understanding of both graphs and this algorithm. Now, this is an example I took from Paris, France. I actually live here, so it was very easy for me to select two points on a map. I decided to find the shortest path between the Eiffel Tower and the Arc de Triomphe. If you look to the right, you'll see that I broke down this path into a few different points from A to F. And I weighted each edge with a number in white. And I wrote down the graph as an adjacency list right to the left of it. In this example, we'll be looking for the shortest path between A and F, and we'll be going through each one of these points to find which path is the shortest. The white numbers are the values in time that we will be taking into account when determining what path is the shortest. Let's take a quick look at the overview of the methodology for this algorithm. So we're going to create a list of all the nodes in the graph, and we're going to visit each one of these nodes. And when we do visit each one of these nodes, we're going to be looking at each one of the neighboring nodes of this node. There, we're going to calculate the distance from the neighbor node to the starting node. So the starting node will be A, we'll go to the next node B, and we'll look at B's neighbors. Perhaps that's D and F. And we're going to calculate the distance back from D and from F 
2a through b. If this distance is less than the previous total, we'll save the shorter distance for that node and then we'll cycle to the next node. So let's look at a practical example now. Here you're going to see a few things. The first thing that you may notice is that I have a Google Maps or Apple Maps representation path between the Eiffel Tower and the Arc du Triomphe. So we have nodes of A through F with the weight of the edges in between each one of the nodes. So we have one, two, one, five, six, one, seven. To the left of this, you're going to see the graph itself where I have mapped out each one of these nodes with their edges. And to the left, you'll see previous. I accidentally was one slide ahead. This is the first slide. And previous is going to keep track of the node with the shortest time from the start that came before it. Visited is going to keep track of all the nodes that have been visited. So we don't go over the same nodes twice. And this table is representing an object whose key will be A, B, C, D, E, F, and whose value for each key will be the corresponding number value. So when we first start, we're selecting the very smallest value and all the other values that are not start get infinity, whereas the value we're starting at, which will be A, gets zero. We will select this value and from there, we will, we will look at each one of its corresponding edges. And when we look at each one of its corresponding edges, we want to figure out the shortest time from A. So everything is relative to A. So let's go through this and it'll start making more sense to you. From A to B, we see that it's one. And then we, we take this one value and we compare it to the shortest time from start. What's smaller, one or infinity? Well, we know that obviously one is smaller, so we replace infinity with one. And then we replace the null value that was in previous for B and we set it to A. We go to the next value, which is C. And we say that we have a two value here. Is two less than infinity? Yes, it is less than infinity. We'll replace infinity with two and set the C key to A. Once we have examined all the edges in A, now we need to move on to the next node. Well, we determine that by asking ourselves, what is the shortest distance, B or C? And well, obviously one is smaller than two, so we're going to select B. And now we're going to look at the edges of B. We won't be looking at A because we've already visited A and you're going to see that we don't need to go back to it. So we're going to be looking at D now. So from B to D, we have one. So we're going to add this one to this one to get two. And we're going to ask ourselves, is two greater than infinity? Yes, it is. So we replace infinity with two and we set the previous key of D to B. And we also push the B key into visited. The third edge that B has is F. So again, we're going to take this connection, this weight of six, and we're going to add it to the value that is right here, this one, and that gives us seven. Is seven greater than infinity? We make this comparison down here. Yes, it is, or sorry, is infinity greater than seven? Yes, it is. So we replace infinity with seven and set this previous value to B. Now that we've went through all the edges of B, we need to select the smallest value out of all of B's edges that have not yet been visited which includes D and F. Well, since F is actually the end point, we won't be visiting that anyway. And also, D is smaller than F, so it's a very logical choice. So we pick the smallest value of D. So let's compare D's edges. Well, the only edge that it has is 2F. So let's take this value of seven and add it to this value of two to get nine. We'll compare it to F and we'll ask ourselves, is seven or is nine less than seven? No, it is not. So I will not be replacing this seven value with nine and I will not be changing F's previous value. We set F's previous value to B because that was the node that came before it with the smallest value. 
Now that we figured this out, we have no more edges to travel upon. So we need to go back to this data structure and look at the vertexes that have not yet been visited. Well, we have A, B, and D that have been visited. We need to go to the smallest, which is C, because 2 is smaller than infinity, and 2 is also smaller than F, and, two is all, and F is also the endpoint, so we don't need to look at that one anyway. So let's look at C's edge. Okay, so this one value, we take it from the edge and we add it to C's 2. Is 3 less than infinity? Yes, it is less than infinity, so we replace it here. And then we replace this previous value of null at E with C. That rounds up all of C's edges. So the last thing we're going to look at is E. Is 3E plus 5 less than 7? at f? No, it is not. So we do not replace f. And since f is the only thing remaining and it equals the destination or the end, we should have all the information we need to build a final path. And how do we do this now? Well, here's a little pseudocode to help illustrate it. We'll take the current node, which is f, and we'll do a while loop and push the current node to the path. So let's start with F. So let's imagine we push F in. Now what do we do now? We set the current node to the previous node. So current node is equal to B. We get this value from this key. We set it to current node and then again we push B in here. And then we get the current node. We set the current node equal to the previous node. So we take B, the, the value of B, which is A. And on the next loop, we push A in, and current node will then be equal to the value of this key A, which is null. And then null will break and will end the loop. And the path will finally end up being FBA, which is what you see right here, FBA. So I know that was a lot and a bit confusing. To break it down one more time for you guys, and I'm not going to go through every single part of it, but... To give you a very brief explanation, what we're doing here is we're just picking the current smallest distance from A. We explore the neighbors of the specific node that we have not yet visited. And when we explore each of, each of its neighbors, we calculate the new shortest distance to its neighbor. And if the distance is smaller, we save the value here in this table. And we save this the previous value here in this object. And with this method, we're able to work backwards to figure out what the shortest path was. So congratulations on getting past that part. I'm now going to present to you the overarching theory that combines the binary search, the graph, and the Dijkstra's algorithm to give us this feature. So here I've created a simple overview of the class we are going to write in code. Now, this graph class is going to help us solve the two main problems that stand in the way of us creating this feature. The first problem is that link is going to be on a specific tile and we won't know what tile it is. The only thing that is going to give us a clue as to where link is, is the X and Y value of all of the tiles that we have and links X and Y value. The second problem is once we know what tile link is standing on, we need to figure out every tile that is in between him and the enemy. And we need to propel the enemy down this path. So we're going to have two data structures to help us accomplish this. The first is going to be our graph, or the standard idea of the graph I've introduced to you before. Now, this graph is going to have edges, so we'll know the neighboring navigatable tiles, as well as where these tiles are on the X and Y axis. And then we're going to have a second data structure that can be described as an associative array. And this is going to be a two-dimensional array whose first order dimension are X axis values, and its second order dimension are Y values, with the final third dimension being the tile ID. 
And a more formal description I wrote down is this. So what is the, no the node ordered graph property? It's an object or an associative array where each key will be an X position for a node's entity's position. The value will be another object. This object will hold every node's Y value that has the same X as a key. Finally, this last key will hold the tiles ID. And I'll also reiterate why we are doing this. So we're doing this because we will be using the positional values to connect the player and the enemy to the screen with the purpose of getting what tile the enemy is on and what tile the player is on. And a little information about the implementation. So as the index.js creates the entity with the node component, we will take that entity's position component and its ID and use those values to build out this data structure. We will then take the enemy in the players X and Y and use the binary search function through the X keys and then the Y keys to find the tile ID that they're standing on. And once we have that tile ID, we can use it in the Dijkstra's algorithm. So let's say the player is 20 on tile 23 and we need to get to tile 27. This property is what's going to determine what our starting point is and what our end point is. And Dijkstra's algorithm is going to give us the directions of how we get there. Now I'll read this information. I hope this isn't over explaining it, but maybe it might be good for me to reiterate some things. So what is this graph property? Well, it is a graph. It's the data structure I just had, we had just worked with, but I'll read this. So it is an array ordered by the tile ID that contains the edges, its connections to adjacent node tiles and the position of each tile entity. And why are we doing this? We are going to use an algorithm, the Dijkstra's algorithm, to follow the connections of nodes from a starting point, which is the enemy, to reach a destination, which is the player, which is Link. And how do we do this? We are going to add each node to the array, and after we will check if its neighboring nodes exist. We will know its neighbors based on the ID of each node. So that is a brief overview of how we are going to navigate our enemy properly through this world. Okay, so now you and I are finally going to put pen to paper, hammer to nail. We're gonna start writing out the graph and the algorithm that goes along with it. Now I went ahead and took the liberty of just creating this graph.js file as well as a few instructions on how to make Dijkstra's algorithm. We're not going to tackle this just yet. Let's create the graph first. And let's make sure that we're properly creating the graph property that keeps track of, of all of the nodes. So we're going to start off by saying class graph. We're going to set the constructor to here. And I know that we're going to actually pass the player into this graph. So let's just set this right here and you'll see why in a little bit. We're going to make two properties, the properties that I referred to before. So that this graph and this graph is going to be represented as a array. And then this node ordered graph because it'll be ordered by position and we'll set it as an object ordered by position. And we can even take the notes from here and use that to help us with its under with understanding what's going on and how it should look okay graph equals then And then this node ordered graph, we'll also take this information.
and I'll write this one out. This node ordered graph is equal to. So imagine these are x values. I'm just making these up. And I'll just do one value. Don't need to go a little, don't need to go too crazy with this, but. Let's start it at, I don't know, 150. Then this will be linked to tile ID 23. So X axis, Y axis, tile ID. And the first thing I wanna do is I wanna build out the graph data structure. Well, how do we do that? Well, as I stated, we need to know two things. We need to know the position of the tile, which that one's easy. I can already think about it now, right? We can go into index.js. And as we are building our level, right? As we're loading our screen, pretty much anything that doesn't have a collision component will be navigatable, more or less. There may be some additional logic, but that's the basics of it. You know what's a little bit more tricky, though, is how do we determine what tiles are connected to one another? It takes a little bit of thought, right? Because we don't have necessarily anything mapping the relationship, do we? Hmm. Well, there is actually one thing that I came up with, and I think it makes sense, is that we can use the fact that we always know the number of columns and the number of rows to our advantage. I'm going to go live here. And I'm going to pull this up. Let's ignore the enemy for now. Let's put on our debug system. And I want to ask you, do you notice a pattern between the relationships of the IDs? Because there's one that sticks out to me. Any ID that is a connecting space, right? Like maybe this path, if you follow my mouse, the ones that are horizontally next to each other, they're only one ID away from one another. They're, they're neighbors, they're 43, 45, 46, 47, 48, right? So anything that's to the left or right of a space just is one less or one higher in ID value. For the tiles that are above and below, do you notice another pattern? At first glance, you might notice a pattern. You see 11, uh, 27 minus 11 is 16, 43 minus 27 is 16, 15. 59 minus 43 is 16. However, you get here and you notice something odd. You see that 76 minus 59 is 17. So it doesn't seem like we can use a common difference between these two numbers to see if they're contiguous on the y-axis. However, we actually can with a very minor change to how we're creating our entities. The reason why this is not a consistent difference between these values up here and these values right here is because in our load screen, when there's a entity or a space that is an undefined value, we are not giving it an ID. If we gave all of these undefined values up here IDs, I have a feeling that the math would work out a little bit better for us. So if we go back to our code, Let's go down to where we are working with these tiles. And we see, where is it? We will see where a file is undefined or where a tile is equal to undefined. We're just doing continue. If we create an entity and we set it we create it with an empty array. The number of entities will increase. Now, you may be asking ourselves, is it really necessary to do this? We're not doing anything with these undefined tiles. And that's true, we're not. However, a good principle 
of developing a game and of actually developing a game engine is that literally every single thing in the game has a tile ID. And that includes the spaces that act as padding. Because perhaps in the future, you would want to do something with this padding. In order to do that, you need to have some kind of way to select it. So now that we made this small change, let's save it. Let's go back to our game. So now if you're looking at the tile IDs, they seem very different, don't they? Now this is 23. 59, 60, 61, 62. The tiles that are on the X axis that are contiguous left to right still only are different by one. The tile IDs are only different by one. So we can use this difference as a way to determine that navigatable tiles are next to each other on the X axis. However, let's take a look now at the tiles that are next to each other on the Y axis. So we have 23, we have 41. The difference between those is 18. 59 minus 41 is 18. 77 minus 59 is also 18. 95 minus 77 is also 18. 113 minus 95 is also 18 as well. It looks like we found a winning pattern. So with this winning pattern, we can now construct in our graph each navigatable tiles edges. So let's go back to our index.js file and we can work within the tile space. So right in here, add the navigatable tile to the graph. And since the level is being created from left to right up and down, that means the X values and the Y values are going to be in order. So we're going to build out our graph property and our node order graph property at the same time. And once we are finished loading the level, then the graph having all of the navigatable tiles within it will be able to construct the edges between each node. So I'm going to create a method within the graph class called generate graph. It's going to take the num of tiles and the position dummy component. Now currently, where are we creating the position dummy component? It looks like we're doing it at the bottom. We don't need to have it down so low since we already do know the J, the J value and the Y value. What we can do is why don't we move it up here so we have access to it earlier. We can drop it right here. And we will call this, this method generate graph num of tiles and position dummy component. We also don't have the number of tiles since the registry has this value and it's actually, it hasn't been updated yet. We need to take a slightly different approach. Let's just create this value outside and this will be a kind of tracker we will increment it upon every pass of the for loop. We could pass it in here. So then we should have the proper ID. You know, let me change that to ID to make it more clear. ID of tile. Because that's what it really will be used for. And now we can begin to build out both the graph property and the node ordered graph property. So this graph, we're going to use it as an array that has its keys ordered by the ID. So ID of tile, we're going to set it equal to an object. And this object is going to have edges 
which will be undefined at first. We will figure that out later once all of the, the nodes are in the graph. And then we will pass the position. The position dummy component dot value, which is coming from right here. So that's simple enough. Next, we need to build out the node ordered graph property. And we need to think about this a little bit more carefully. Because as we saw, there are going to be multiple navigatable tiles that have the same axis. So if we look back at our game, oh, and now it's crashing. And I know why, because it has it does not have graph being defined. So let's just do that. There we go. If we look over here, these yellow tiles, they actually have the same X. So we need some kind of way to differentiate between this X, or sorry, they have the same Y value, excuse me, and they have different X values. So we need to be able to differentiate between these two Y values, not get confused. And the same goes for this value, uh, this tile that's on top of this tile. 23 is on top of 41. They have the same X values, but different Y values. So the way we will set up our data structure is going to look like this. Just like how I wrote it in this comment. Let's imagine for a second that 23 here, 23 and 41 have their x value is zero which it is and obviously it's not zero but let's just imagine that for a second the way we would differentiate between 23 and 41 is by having multiple y values so 23's y value might be 150 which it's not but again just for the sake of explanation while 41 its y value might be 225 and from there we can figure out what tile id each one is. So that's the theory. So we want to check out first if this node ordered graph, now we're going to get the x position. So let's const x, y from position dummy component value. So if this node order graph x is equal to undefined, which it is when it starts, then we need to create this object. We need to create this second order array. So this node ordered graph x is equal to an empty object. If it's undefined or it's not undefined, however, the logic that follows this logic structure is the same. We want to do this node order graph x and y is equal to the id of tile and that's it so let's test this out let me export the graph so we can access it export default so we can access it from index.js And I'm going to initialize it in the game. The game class will have this as one of its main properties. So this graph is equal to new graph. And let's import it. Import graph from classes graph.js. Let's do a quick check. Um, oh, wait, this is not the same name. Let me fix that. Okay. Now let's console.log out both the graph property, this graph property, this graph and this node ordered graph property this node ordered graph okay and let's see what we get 
Now I know that there's going to be oh, many spaces in between for the graph property. It looks like it worked properly though, right? I think we built this correct. Let's just double check. So at X 287 and at Y 70, looking at this, we have ID 23. And since 23 and 41 have the same X axis, just a difference in the Y position, we see this right here. It lines up pretty perfectly, doesn't it? That's great. And then for this graph property, let's go in and we'll look at 23. And just like what it was in the node ordered graph property, the X is 287 and the Y is 70. So that's correct. The edges are undefined again, but no worries. We're going to take care of that shortly. 41 right here. Same 280 as 23. That's good. And the Y is incremented by 70. That's perfect. That's exactly what it should be. So very good. We built our graph properly. Let's now build the edges of the graph. Using that pattern that we noticed, I think it'll be quite intuitive to build this out. We want to do it when the load screen function is completed. So why don't we call a method at the very end. Let me just scroll up here and make sure this is the very end of the for loop. We can call it right here. This, this graph generate edges. And we can just call it. I don't believe we need any kind of parameters to be passed, so that's good. Let's define this function in the graph class. So how are we going to create the edges? Well, we need to go through every entry in the graph and check if its neighbor exists. And by neighbor, I mean anything to the left or the right of it, which would be one less or one more than its own ID. And anything above it or below it, which would be 18 less or 18 more, respectively. So let me write out this code. Let's use the object.entries method to go through this graph and pull out each entry the key value of each entry and the value. The key value will be its own ID, which we need, and the value will be the object that contains the edges array. So the ID, let's do const ID is equal to entry times or zero times one. And the reason I'm timesing it by one is to coerce the string to a number. Then let's set the edges property to an open array or to an empty array. So entry one edges is equal to zero or sorry, equal to an empty array. And now we're ready to push values into this edges array. So let's check to see if its neighbor exists yet. So if this graph ID minus one exists. That means that the current value we're examining has a neighbor that's navigatable. It has a neighbor to its left that is navigatable is the key point. So there is a neighbor to its left that is navigatable. Then let's push this ID into the edges property. So push neighbor ID into edge. So let's get the neighbor ID, neighbor ID, ID minus one. And also let's just do const edges or let edges is equal to entry one edges just to make it a little bit cleaner edges push neighbor ID. 
or to make it even slightly cleaner than that, let's just set the neighbor ID equal to undefined. Like that. Then if neighbor ID, we can push it. If there is no neighbor, it never gets pushed in. So we can just follow this pattern. If this graph ID plus one, so there is a neighbor to its right that is navigatable, neighbor ID equals ID plus one. Now, if this graph ID minus 8, there is a neighbor above it that is navigatable neighbor ID is equal to ID minus 18 there is a neighbor below it that is navigatable this graph ID plus 18 neighbor ID equals to ID plus 18 okay and that should be it once this is done I want to console dot log out this graph And let's check out what we got. Let's examine the graph. And also let's turn on the debug mode so we can verify this information. So I'm taking 23. So 23, its edge is 41. That's correct. 25, its edge is to 43. That is also correct. 27 has an edge to 45 but not to 28. 46. Okay, so there's an issue with left to right. That's fine. We'll fix that. Let's take a look at 59 because it has a neighbor in every direction. Ah, 77. Okay. It's only going... It's only working for the values that are above it. Let's see what is going on here. Oh, well, that's simple. It's because every time it's being overridden. That was silly of me. We actually do need an individual edge or an individual push for every if statement. Let's try this again. Refresh just to make sure that worked. Okay. This graph, let's see. Let's just go directly to 59. Okay, so let's see what we have. We have 59 is connected to 41. True. 59 is connected to 58. True. 59 is connected to 60. True. 59 is connected to 77. True. So that looks like it is now working in every direction. Let me see, 23 is connected to 41. Let's take 41 for example. 41 is also connected to 23, very good. And it's also connected to 59, which it should. Let's check 28 right here. It's connected to 27, it is. And it's connected to 46. The one thing about this is that we are not looking for horizontal values, although we very well could be. Other than that, no, everything looks like it should. Okay, so now that we have the two properties for the graph completed, we can begin with creating the Dijkstra's algorithm function. And I'm going to very simply move this binary search function into the graph since we'll be using it here we can also just create it here let's 
you just copy this and we'll also pass the same argument so array and target so very cool we won't uh we won't be using this anymore i'll delete this after and with that we can begin dijkstra's Dijkstra's algorithm. So the one thing that Dijkstra's algorithm will take is an enemy because if you have multiple enemies, you might need to use this for enemies that are located in different positions, obviously. And so if you remember in the model that I created, we're actually going to be starting with the node ordered graph and we're going to be finding the X position and then the Y position and then the ID by using the binary searches. So we're going to take the entity X, which is the enemy, the enemy's X value, and we're going to look for the nearest X to the entity's X value. Then once we find this X, we're going to go through all of the Y's that possibly exist. And we can use, um, let's just use this example up here. So we have 0, 75, 150. Let's pretend our enemy or entity is at 10. So it sees that zero is the closest to the actual position of the enemy. And it will take this zero and the zero's Y values more importantly. So it returns these Y values, the 200, the 275 and the 350. And we'll use this binary search again, but this time passing the entity's Y value to get this ID. So let's go back to our code and let's pull out first the enemy's position. So position enemy position. So enemy dot components. And then let's pull out the enemies X and Y. So const X E X and Y E Y out of enemy position. And we'll simply pass this E X value to the binary search function. And we'll save it in the uh, and we'll save the result. And we'll save the result of this as possible y, I'll say enemy possible y values. And actually, this won't be a destructuring. This is just the result is equal to binary search. This node order graph ex, right? And then once we get those possible values, we can just call this again to get the enemy's nearest possible Y value. So enemy nearest Y value, or sorry, it actually is just the enemy, enemy closest X value. It's not possible values. It is the single value. So enemy closest Y value. So this node ordered graph, and now we pass this in because it's like the index of the object. And let me double this. So I want to visualize it. So we're let's say we're getting zero, then we need to access zero and to pass this Y to pass this array at the Y axis in. And we'll pass what we're looking for is the is the value closest to the enemy Y. And we can get the ID of the tile start ID is equal to this node ordered graph, enemy closest X, enemy closest Y. And let's just start off by console logging this out to see that it's working, start ID. And we can call this function on update. We 
can even do it in here. This graph, and actually maybe not in the for loop though, we'll do it outside of the for loop. This graph, Dijkstra's algorithm. Actually, no, we will do it in the for loop because we have access to the individual enemy here. Let's see how that works. Let's reset it. Uh, binary search is not defined. It makes sense because we need to add the this keyword to it. And I think also now that I'm looking at it is that we do need to change this array because let's do like this, this letter array, arg array. We do need to change it because it will not properly read this object. We just need the keys, arg array. Okay. Let's see what we get. Oh, 60. I think it's lagging a little bit. Just give it a minute. Sixty two ninety eight one thirty four. That looks good to me. Okay, let's close this out. So that seems to be working. Now let's remove this Dijkstra's algorithm. And let's do the same thing, but for the player now. So we'll take out player position let's change this to px and py player position we'll fix this const player closest x value this binary search this node ordered graph px const enemy closest or sorry player closest y value player closest y value this binary search node ordered graph player closest x value then pass in py then const finish ID is equal to this node ordered graph player closest X player closest Y. And now with that done, we're able to begin the actual Dijkstra's algorithm. So we have our start node and our end node essentially. And we will create our priority queue. We'll call this nodes treat as priority queue. And what I want to do is I would like to pull up this. Now, of course, it's not perfect because it's a different data set we're working with, but I want to illustrate for you what each thing is. And you can think of this as the list of nodes that we're going through. So you can kind of think about it as this column. Now we're going to have a second data structure that has both columns in it, and that's going to be called distances. So hopefully that's not too confusing. You're going to see a little bit more in a second. Our next data structure is going to be previous, and that is also going to have key value pairs. 
And that's all the data structures we need for right now. If you look at this example, you also see that there's visited. But at the moment, we don't need visited to make our Dijkstra's algorithm work. And I'll show you why in a second. We could do some things to optimize it using visited, but I'll keep it as simple as possible and go along without it. It was good that you learned this kind of implementation, but this is a more simple, effective implementation for what we needed to do. We're only going to have three data structures to take care of, so it'll be much easier for us. And the first thing I want to do is I want to set up the distances data structure, which this is the table. You can just look at this as the table. This is the single column. The table also does have the vertex column as well. It's, it's a bit of a doubling of the, or not doubling uh, of the data, but we do need the same data in two places. And you'll see, and you'll see why right now. So for let key in this graph, so we're going to go through this graph right here and we're going to take A, B, C, D, E, F. If the start ID is equal to the vertex and the vertex is going to be the ID that the enemy is on. So actually, I just sorry, I should say key. There we go. Key. For the distance of the key, set it to zero just like in the table, right? And then we're going to push this as an object, which is the key. So we're going to push it like this. The val is going to be the key, which is essentially the key is entity ID and the priority is zero. And distance is key. You know, let me just change this to vertex because technically it is a vertex. Vertex, there we go. It feels more natural. And we set to infinity. Nodes push val vertex priority infinity. You're going to see in a moment why we need to set up the data like that. Let me copy and bring this down here. Oh, not all of it though. Oh, let me copy paste this. Right here so we can follow along. Cool, we'll have this as a guide. But something we also want to do is every time we push a value to the queue, we want to sort it by priority because we are trying to always access the node with the lowest priority first. So we need to do a node sort. And we can just use this as the logic lowest priority will always be at the will be at the front of the queue and let's set the previous vertex to null cool now for following this outline that i wrote uh, create we're at number six where create while loop to go through priority queue while any values are in it so while nodes nodes dot length dq the the current id the current vertex rather so nodes shift value
And if this current node ID, if the vertex same as ending, so if current node ID is actually equal to finish ID, that means we're ready to determine what the end path was. So if you remember here, we just looped through previous. So again, to reiterate, we got to F and then we accessed the key of F for B. We pushed F in and then we accessed the key of B in previous and we got A. We pushed B in and then we finally went to A and there was nothing there and we pushed A in and that was the end of the path. We finished it that way. So while previous current node ID. So let's say, so again, for example, let's say the current node ID is equal to F, right? Then we're going to, and actually I need one more data structure, const path. This will be the thing that gets returned at the end of all of this, right? So then we do path push current node ID and we reset the current node ID to previous current node ID. So if the current node is F, we push it in and then we get the previous, the previous, uh, the data structure of previous will get B here if we're following this example or the example that I put in the diagram. Okay, but if it's not the finish ID, right? So that means we need to still find the shortest path. So we're somewhere over here. We need to go through, let's see, let's see what I said. File path else, loop through each edge in the value in the graph pulled from prior queue. Yup. And now we need to get the edges. So we can get const edges, this graph, now current node ID, so just like here, so let's say we're starting at A, and oop, let's go to this one. Let's say we're starting at A. This is an exact data structure because this is an array, it's not the same exact one. We're getting this object so we need to do this current node ID and then edges. And then for let edge of edges, let's console.log out edge. This actually just may be the neighbor ID. And are we calling it? No, let's call Dijkstra's from index.js. go to where the enemy is created again this will slow down the game by quite a substantial amount but that's fine enemy it's fine for the moment okay let's see how this works so far Graph 75, let's see. We're getting some errors. Cannot read properties of undefined components. Out of graph 86. Oh, this player, because I misspelled player. Don't think I'm passing player to the graph. No, I'm not. What is player? Undefined. So this graph is equal to new graph. This stop player. Make sure to pass it. Okay, cool. Now we have distance is not defined. 123. Ah, distance is. Ah, 
Okay. One twenty three again. Wait, I need to save it. Okay, let's. Now that that's defined, let's see how we're doing. Okay, cool. So yes, the edge is the ID. So we're doing something right so far. Very good. So what I'm going to just name this is instead of naming it edge to be clear, I'll just say neighbor ID. So it's not confusing. There we go. So we're going to create a combined weight. And I know in that example, we have a weighted graph. A lot of times in the real world, you're going to be working with weighted graphs because there's typically a cost associated with movement, whether that's in time, whether that's in distance, there's some kind of cost for our game. Since we are just moving tile by tile and each tile is standardized, meaning that it's the same height and width and that there's no kind of slow or speed up effect when passing over certain tiles. There's no real need for us to use a weighted graph. So it's actually quite simple for us. We can just add one onto the distances, which is really nice. So we can do distances, neighbor or current, sorry, current node ID. Let's compare again. And we can do a simple compare of the combined weight and see if the combined weight is less than the distances neighbor ID, then we want to set the distances neighbor ID value to this new combined weight. We want to update the previous ID to the current node ID. And we want to push the value of the neighbor ID and its new combined weight onto the node. So what we just did was we determined the distance from the vertex to the starting vertex, or sorry, from the neighboring, neighboring vertex to the current vertex to the starting to, to the starting vertex essentially. And if the distance is less than what is in the distance object, and we did these three things. So at the very end of this, we should have a path completely built up. So I'm going to console.logout path, and I'm going to return path. I'm going to get rid of this console.log. And let's take a look at what we have now. So, okay. Okay, it looks like one is a string and one is not. We could fix that a little bit later. So let's map this out. It's a little confusing since the enemy is traveling over collidables that he shouldn't be traveling over. I want to do something really quick. I want to disable the enemy in his movement to make sure that this is working properly. So let's go to the, let's go to state machine and let's just hold off on doing any executing for the enemy. I think I set up the velocity of the enemy to be one. Yes, I did. So let's set this to zero. Okay. Now let's see if the path is correct. Just from a stationary point. I'm going to fix this. But right now he is at 41. Okay. So it started with the endpoint first, but let's just work backwards. We can reverse this array. That's very simple. Let's start. So he's at 41, 59. If he goes down, that's here, 60, 
he moves one to the right. 61, he moves again to the right. 79, he moves down. It's 97, he moves down. 115, he moves down. 133, he moves down. Then 134, he as is at Link's position. That is great. So it's working properly, at least from this point. Now, I'm going to move Link, and let's see if this changes. It's lagging a little bit because uh, it's a very expensive thing to do and we won't be implementing this in the final position this won't be the final implementation so don't worry it won't lag as much but we can see the path changes look at the console.logs that's great so let's start again so 59 60 61 62 63 64 65 66 67 68 69 that's right where link is and you can see it does some pretty uh advanced tracking let's put him in the corner Let's see if our enemy can find him. So again, we're starting at 41. He goes to 59, 60, 61, 62, 63, 64, 65, 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 88, 106, 124, 142, 160, and then 178, which is where Link is. It looks pretty good, guys. I think I like how it looks. Now all we need to do is make our enemy move along this path and we have created our first complex enemy AI behavior. So cool. I love it. And then when he's on top, so you can even see when he's on top, there is no path. And then 23, there is, he's on 23. Great. So let's go into this, cancel this out. And to finish up this part, we are going to now have our enemy have access to the graph through his state and use the graph in his state to hunt down Link. Now, when we first created the state machine in all of its states, I did mention that the states that we were making would be revamped. We won't be using those states. Instead, we're, we're gonna pretty much delete most of them to make room for the new state that's going to control its hunting behavior. So first off, let's just make a small change to the state machine. And this state machine, if you don't remember, he has the owner and the player property. We're going to get rid of the player, which I did mention we would be doing. We would not be using the player itself, but rather the graph. And we're going to be using this graph to help the enemy find the player. Let's unconsole log this and let's replace this in the execute. Now let's go into states. And you see we have search states and then we have a variety of move states. Now this was great as an exercise and I hope it helped illustrate to you how the states are supposed to work. But we're going to do something that's a much more efficient with less code. So I'm actually, I'm going to get rid of all of the states. Delete all of them. And we're going to have one state called class search state, which will serve the function that we were kind of handling before where the entity looks for link. We're going to have a constructor. We'll fill the state out later. Let's just set up the basics of it. So it has enter, execute, exit with the enemy and game graph, which won't be used, but that's fine. The next state that we will have is the hunt oh, class hunt player state. Constructor. And we'll have the three functions. Exit. And this will take the enemy 
and the game graph we'll just call it a graph i don't need to say game graph and here's where the magic is going to happen so we're going to get the enemy's path right in here and we're going to call dykstra's algorithm so graph dykstra's let me just make sure i don't misspell it dykstra's algorithm i'm going to pass the enemy in like that and we're going to get back the path that we need in order to find our player and if we're starting from the end first let's just get the length or like we'll get the final index right we'll set this to let because i have a feeling we're going to pop the path at the very end of this we'll set the next node id is equal to path.length so while path.length we'll do a for loop and we're going to start by moving the enemy from his current position to the X and Y of the next tile. So we're going to get const X is equal to enemy X, Y, enemy Y is equal to enemy components position. Then we're going to do x next tile x y next tile y is equal to graph next node id and i believe the name is position but let me just see graph generate graph I'm Yep, position. Could probably just see that up here. We're going to get the position component and the value. And our logic is going to be if the enemy X is greater than X, the enemy and we know what I'm going to do. I'm also going to pull out the enemy components. Why don't I do that too? So position movement. The movement Vx is equal to negative one. However, if enemy minus x, oh, x is less than zero, that means the x is greater. We need to move him in the opposite direction. Vx is equal to one. And if both cases are not true, then that must mean it is equal to zero. So let's set the X velocity equal to zero. We can do the same for Y as well. So if enemy Y minus Y is greater than zero, movement V Y is equal to minus one. Else if enemy Y minus one is less than zero, movement vy is equal to one else movement vy is equal to zero and to make sure we don't run into a problem that we ran into before where our enemy was gyrating back and forth really quickly because he was between values let's set up this approximation so let's use math absolute enemy x minus x We'll set it to two. We can just set position X equal to X as well as enemy Y minus Y is less than two. Position Y is equal to Y. 
or less than or equal to two, I should say. And finally, when the enemy gets to the exact X and Y value of the tile, we should pop the tile ID from the path. So that way he can move on to the next tile in the sequence. So if enemy oh, X is equal to X and enemy Y is equal to Y, we can do path pop. Cool. And the second state that we need to create in order for this to work is going to be the search state. So similar to the beginning portion of it, we will be also doing Dijkstra's algorithm. And we're just going to determine if the path is equal to zero, then then we should do one thing and then if it's not we should do something else and hold on I'm going to handle that in one second oh, let's just change I was going to call this next tile but let's just use X and Y looks good let me just change this actually to enemy X and Y respectively. Final index. This needs to be lowercase x. Okay, cool. And if we go back up to the top, so my plan was to determine if the path was empty, however, this might be a little computationally expensive. We can instead just easily set it on an interval. That's actually what I would prefer to do. And I did mention that most states would not have any data associated with it. And I did say there would be an exception. This is going to be one of those rare exceptions where it deviates from the rule. So I'm going to just have this set up on like a, a three or two second timer. We can do about two and a half seconds. If it's less than or equal to date now, then enemy, ooh, enemy state machine change state, hunt player state. Oh, let's uh, export const hunt player state is equal to new hunt player state. Export const search state is equal to new search state. There we go. Hunt player state, okay. And we'll just, after this fires, change global state, we will fire this search state again. So it'll, every single time that it's fired, it will change the state again, reset the timer and wait two and a half seconds. Let's just make sure we are passing the owner we don't need the graph, but I'll pass it anyway to keep it consistent. Okay, that looks good. And so confusingly, we actually need to do graph.graph .graph because we need to get it from, we need to get the next node ID from this array, the property of graph. Let's see how that looks. Okay, we have an error, assignment to constant variable at 60 enemy x, ah yes. Let's just set this to let. Right, let's refresh that. And now it looks like it's stuck in the while loop. And that actually makes sense. I hadn't thought about it before, but it's constantly going through this loop and it's actually putting the whole entire game on hold while it's running because this is synchronous, not asynchronous. 
So we actually should just do an if. Let's look again. Oh, I need to actually just restart this instance because it's frozen. Oh. Let's see. Hmm. He moves one down, but not much further. Ah, and it's because I just wrote enemy instead of enemy X. Oh, try it again. And it looks pretty good. There is lag again, but that's not because of this game. It's because of my own, uh, it's because of the recording software that I'm using. So it looks good. Let me move link. Very cool. Okay, it looks pretty good. He actually, it's, it's even hard to juke him out. He travels diagonally, but I kind of like that at the moment. I did not think I would. I think I'll leave that since, since Link can at the moment travel diagonally. Might as well just leave that for him as well. Cool, not bad. And let's clean up as well. I don't want to forget that we do need to get rid of the enemy. Actually, in this file. Enemies. Ha, huh, I knew there was a good reason to keep enemies in here. So that way, when the enemy is... When, the, when Link walks off screen, the enemy will be unloaded. While thinking of that, I have realized there are a few bugs. Like, for example, if we don't have a weapon and we swing our sword, it bugs. Let's fix that. I believe that would be in the, what is that? In the render animation. Let's see where it said, uh, just 229. Ah, uh, yes, it's because we need to do, we need to check for active first, because that's one of the good old quirks of JavaScript. Let's see now. Cool. It doesn't error. However, Link still runs the animation. So let's go into index.js. And for handle input, let's make it so Link can only swing his sword when there is a sword to swing or some kind of weapon to swing at least. So let's do, we need to get the inventory. I'll follow this pattern. Player inventory component. Although I kind of wish I just pulled it out now since now we're amassing components, but it's okay. We'll just keep it like this. inventory or dot active a so now it should only be set to true if there is an active a cool and let's actually get the sword because i have a feeling now up uh, another crit cannot read property of undefined 525 but anyway, as I was saying, I have a feeling that there may be an issue with how we're currently handling it, which will be quickly solved. Just put screen object.enemies again. JavaScript is short circuiting because of that. Let's see. Perfect. If we run into the shop. And we take the sword. Let's just make sure that still works, which it should. Ooh. Again, the lag you're seeing, it's just my recording software. If I run out, I have a feeling that the weapon is going to disappear from the uh, from my inventory. 
So let's check that. Yeah, I don't have it. So what we were doing before no longer will work well enough for us. So we need to make modifications to the to the create player function, which is right here. Now, before we were initially making some changes based on uh, the component type right here. This worked well before, but now why don't we just instead pass the entire player into the next screen? Or better yet, why don't we just do... How about we'll just get position and we'll just change where the player is on the screen. I thought before that maybe this would have been a better initial approach, even though it was a bit more complex because we could make more changes to the components from screen to screen. But I don't think we're actually going to need to make those changes anymore. So why don't we just do co x times tile size. Position y is equal to co y. I'll make this bigger. Times tile size. And after we set these position values, let's not forget to put this back into the next screen like this. We can get rid of that. Let's set a return. Let's actually just move this down here. Okay, it seems to work properly. Let's go get the sword. Make sure that it stays after picking it up. And it does, cool. One other thing though, the sword is still here. Well, first let me show you how we're going to fix this. Let's go into where we are loading our screen. So let's fix this by first just looking at the act tile again. So I wrote this right here. We have to have remove set to true. Now, we don't want to set remove to true because it's possible that Link could enter the dungeon without him taking the sword. And if he leaves, then the next time he walks back in, the sword will not be there. We need to only fire this right after the Link pick up, pick up sword animation is complete. So, we can just set it to, uh, to, to true in here. And the way we do that is if we go into screens, we see the tile itself and the tile itself is right here so why don't we import the shop and set it within and set that tile within this animation so we can I think just probably set it anywhere I don't think it'll matter too much we could set it at the bottom uh, shop and we have to get screen. And let's see how many X's down. One, two, five. So it's one, two, three, four, five. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so it's five, eight. And we'll set the remove to true. And to make this simple for us, let's just load in the shop immediately. Go back to the game, take the sword, cool, and it's no longer there, I can even run to the old man, it's not there anymore, fantastic. Okay, I just saw that the sword appears behind him when he's running, so obviously let's fix that, that looks ugly. And that's not how this should work. Now, I want to set it up personally. I'd rather him have to stand still to be able to swing the sword. I think that'll make the gameplay slightly better, more challenging. So let's go into our code. 
And to do this, the first thing that I want to do is I want to change the handle input. And whenever the player is moving, I'm just going to set the is attacking to false. So for every direction, it'll be false. And then we're going to handle this also in the system because this, there's two systems that deal with the swinging of the sword. The first one is the animation system and then the second system is the render system. So the logic behind this is if the user is moving, we want to make sure that they cannot attack. However, if the user is not moving but is attacking, they should be able to attack. So it seems like to me the main condition, and I'm just going to create mode like that, the main condition is going to basically say if the user is is or should animate if the user is not moving but they are attacking then we will set the mode to attack the other case will be mode equal to move there and we'll take this logic and just move it up to render system replace mode And now let's also pull out the should animate from here. And in this if statement, we can just replace the is attacking. Set this, set the first one to attack. The second one will just be for move. Let's go and see what we have. Oh, move is not defined. I meant to write mode. And there we go, I can't attack while moving. Link stops and then he can attack. Very good, so we got rid of that ugly glitch. The sword still stays with us.